Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of the worlds. Was salatu was salamu ala al mab'uthi rahmatan lil alameen. Complete blessings and salutations to the one who was sent as mercy to mankind. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may the blessings and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon all his companions and all of us who are seated here today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all offspring who will be the champions of this deen inshallah. Honored ulama, beloved brothers and sisters and dearest listeners, we commenced with the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam that is in Surah Al-Anbiya, the surah that Allah has named after the Anbiya and the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we take a careful look at the surah at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us about the fact that we are all going to perish very, very soon. And Allah speaks of the day of reckoning. Definitely the hour of reckoning is very, very close to man. But man is playing, turning away whilst very oblivious of that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can always be conscious of the fact that we could be dying at any moment and inshallah that will help us to be better people allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam and what he told his father he was a young boy in fact he was a young man his father was a lot older than him and one day he told his father ya abati inni qad ja'ani min al-ilm ma lam ya'tika fattabi'ni O my father, knowledge has come to me that has not come to you. So follow me and inshallah I will lead you to the right path. Allahu Akbar. What do we learn from this? We learn from this that sometimes those who are much younger than us will come to us with knowledge that we have nothing about meaning we have no knowledge about and they will come up with something that will be regarded as solid knowledge they could be our own children sometimes our children will come up to us and say you know what daddy this is wrong in islam this is the ruling and this is the verse of the quran this is the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam here it is sometimes our daughters will come up to their mothers and say you know what my dear mother this is not the way you should be dressing it happens so we must regard that as a point of mercy because if they are right, then we accept it on merit, not on how old they are. We accept the message on merit, not on how old they are. So Azar, the father of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, refused. And he told, his father, uh, he told his son that, you know what, we are going to throw you in the fire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded and instructed the fire. We instructed the fire saying, become cold and be a means of peace upon Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. One of the narrations makes mention of that, the peace. And what happened? When Allah instructed the fire to be a means of peace, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was released into the fire whilst he was tied with ropes. The fire burnt the ropes, but did not harm Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he came out untied. Amazing. So that was a means of his peace and his comfort. When a person is tied, how uncomfortable they are. So when they are loosened once again, they feel very happy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the acceptance and may he grant us the understanding. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the surah makes a very, very important point that we need to learn from. In fact, points of all the Anbiya, the highlight in the surah is that every Nabi made a dua to Allah. Every Nabi called out to Allah. They were all in need. When they called out, they were patient. They waited for the day and the response came. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Remember the time when Nuh called out to us. That means he had a need. There was something he required, a prophet of Allah. And he called out to us. After some time, Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we answered his call. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى Remember when Ayyub alayhi salam called out to us. And after a while, Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we responded the call. Then Allah says, وَذَنُّوا 
الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَن لَّن نَّقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ فَنَادَى يونس عليه الصلاة والسلام he went away and he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says after some time, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We responded that call. We answered it positively. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَزَكَرِيَّا إِذْ نَادَى Remember, even Zakariya alayhi salam called out to us. And Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَا We answered his call and we gave him the child that he wanted. This teaches all of us. We are not prophets. We are far lower than the prophets. Let's call out to Allah for our needs. Allahu Akbar. If those better than us could call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why don't we find ourselves raising our hands and calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be patient for one day the response will come. Remember, when you make a dua, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, give me something. Let me give you a simple example for you to laugh. Ya Allah, give me a VW Golf GTI. If Allah knows it's best for you now, believe me, it will be waiting outside for you. That's not my favorite car, just for your information. <laughs> but at the same time, Allah will give it to you, it will be waiting outside if He knows that that's best for you now. If He knows it's good for you later on, maybe when you mature with your leg slightly and you know how to handle the pedal a little bit, then Allah might give it to you later on because that moves to 260 k's an hour. You might die as a result. It might be a means of your destruction. So through Allah's mercy, He's not giving it to you. Allahu Akbar. Until you mature a little bit. Then he might give it to you. But you can continue making that dua. It's not haram. Then if Allah knows that that's not good for you at all, because you, have, you will never achieve control of this right foot of yours. In that case, he won't give it to you. He might substitute it with a far smaller vehicle and he might give you something in return. Thank Allah. Every one of us must know that whatever Allah has given us is the best for us. Sometimes we make a dua, Ya Allah, get me married to so and so with a name. It's not haram to do that. But Allah knows that that's not good for us. So He creates an obstacle between us and marriage to that person. And what happens? We become upset. Allah didn't answer my call. No ways. Possibly had you married that person, there might have been offspring who were far away from Islam. There might have been some form of destruction. Someone might have died. There might have been a big disease. There might have been something that Allah is protecting you from. So that is why in the dua of istikhara, the dua that we make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say, Oh Allah, if this is better for us in our deen, in our dunya, in our future, then make it easy for us. If not, then take it away from us and make us happy with your distribution. So when Allah has not given you something, you must be convinced that that was not good for you. That is, an, that is a mu'min. Amazing is the affair of a believer. All the affairs of the believers are good for them. They understand and realize that whatever Allah has decided is best for me. Sometimes if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that our hands be amputated or we suffer a sickness, believe me, if we have Iman, we will realize that that was the best for us. But we are weak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us, really, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the acceptance to understand His plan and His decree and never to question it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how He has sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a point of mercy to mankind. Didn't we start this evening's lecture by saying, may the peace and blessings be upon the one whom Allah has sent as a point of mercy for all creation. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have only sent you as a point of mercy to all creation. Do you know that even the cows and the goats that we slaughter, the rahmah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is felt there because he has taught us how to slaughter the animal. And he has said, that whoever would like to slaughter an animal must sharpen the blade and use a swift movement in order to let that animal be at ease. Allahu Akbar. So much so that even the ecosystem around us, Allah has had mercy on it through the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are not allowed to destroy and engage in what is known as deforestation as a religious duty. I'm not allowed to just burn the forests and the fires and so on. No, it's my religious duty to preserve the ecosystem. Allahu Akbar. So we must realize that Islam is a religion that teaches us the whole way of life. It has not left anything out. In the next surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about Qiyamah. And the surah is named Surah Al-Hajj. 
So what is the relation between Qiyamah and Hajj? Let me explain to you. Al-Hajj, we all know what it is. When we go to Arafah, the men folk are dressed in what we would normally enshroud our dead with. Is that not correct? A kafan, similar to a kafan. Two pieces of cloth and that's it. And when we go to Arafah, everyone is raising their hands, making a dua, Ya Allah, give me, grant me, Ya Allah, my, forgive my sins and so on. Everyone returns from Hajj, inshaAllah, as pure as the day they were born. The same applies on the day of Qiyamah, we shall all be standing similarly in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a comparison. Allah commences Surah Al-Hajj reminding us about Qiyamah. Ya ayyuhan nasu attaqu rabbakum, O people, be conscious of your Rabb. Inna zalzalata saati shay'un azim. The hour of the tremor is definitely something very, very severe. The hour of the tremor, what is that? The time of Qiyamah, when the trumpet shall be blown. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yawma tarahunaha, the day you see that hour coming, Tadhhalu kullu murdi'atin amma arda'at. Every breastfeeding woman will forget about what she is doing. She will leave her breastfeeding child. What a comparison. In order to breastfeed a child, a woman needs maximum concentration maximum concentration and the connection is so solid if that connection is not there the woman might suffer certain diseases like mastitis and various other diseases connected to breastfeeding may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our women folk and allah says even that woman will forget not only that allah says every woman who is bearing a child shall be forced into labor it will automatically cause labor. She will be in labor. Why? The huge sound. You know what medicine has proven? And from a long time they've proven this. But the Quran has said it a long time ago. That sometimes when a woman is pregnant and there is some huge sound or some huge worry that comes up, it can cause that woman to go into labor, even prematurely. And that's a fact. Ask all the gynecologists, they will tell you that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So the Quran says, when that hour of tremor comes about, those women who are holding children, they will give birth to those children. People will be dashing about as though they are drunk because there will be such a huge sound. Things will be coming to an end. The mountains shall be flowing as though they are cotton wool. Allahu Akbar. Look at the mountains. You look at them as though they are solid. They will be moving as though they are clouds, like cotton wool. Allahu Akbar. Now you find people will be really berserk. Absolutely berserk. Allah says, you will see them as though they are drunk. But they are not drunk in reality. But the punishment of Allah is so severe. May Allah protect us all. So Allah describes the day of Qiyamah. Zalzalat as Allahu Akbar. What a solid verse. What a vivid description of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can take heed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same surah speaks about Hajj. And he speaks about how Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was instructed to announce the Hajj. وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقًا Make the announcement of Hajj and you shall find people coming for Hajj. Walking on foot and on every lean camel, which means on every mode of transport. Today by sea they come, walking they come. They come by road, they come by air, everything from the furthest corners of the globe. But when the announcement was made, there was no even microphone at that time. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam did not paste it on the internet to say come for hajj. No, it wasn't there. Nowadays our agents do that job for us, mashallah. May Allah make it easy for them also. But Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was instructed to call because of the sincerity of that call. We have heard the call. There was Hajj from that time, but it is only that pre-Islamically they had allowed certain pagan beliefs to creep into the Hajj. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came, what he did was he cleansed it from all forms of shirk 
and it was solely for the sake of Allah. Labbaik la sharik lak labbaik. Inna alhamda wa nigmata lak wal mulk la sharik lak. I'm sure we've heard that so many times. May Allah take us there again and again. Amen. And may Allah make it easy for those who've intended to perform Hajj, inshallah, this year. And may Allah make it easy for those who haven't performed, who, can, who don't have the means. May Allah grant them the means so that they too can taste that spiritual journey at least once in their lives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same surah, He challenges all creation. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ ضُرِبَ مَثَلٌ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهَ O people, an example has been cited, so listen to it very carefully. To show us how weak man is, how weak the created is, when it comes to comparing the created with the creator himself. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ لَنْ يَخْلُقُوا ذُبَابًا Those whom you are calling out to as gods besides Allah cannot create a fly. Allahu Akbar. They cannot create a what? A fly. Not one fly. Imagine a fly is so insignificant, it irritates us. We spread our dooms and killums and bagons in order to get rid of that fly. And Allah is giving the example of that insignificant creature. Nobody can create a fly. Has anyone to this day created a fly? Allahu Akbar. And Allah says, hang on, not only will no one create a fly. Even if everybody got together to try to achieve a fly, they won't. That's the qudra, the power of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. And he didn't stop there. He says, should I show you still how powerful I am? Even if a fly takes away something from you, you will never, ever, ever be able to return it from the fly. Nobody, even if the whole world gets together. Do you know what science has proven? When a fly sits on some sugar, small grain of sugar, when a fly sits on it, it firstly takes something out, then it takes things in. And when it goes away, it has changed that sugar to the degree that you can never ever return the sugar to what it was, no matter what. Bring technology, bring science, it's impossible. Allahu Akbar. So Allah is showing us how weak we are. Forget creating the fly. Even if a fly takes something away from you, Forget about returning it to where it was. A fly, Allah has shown us that example. This is how weak we are. So Allah says, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was a submitter. He submitted and he asked everyone to submit as well. We've sent messengers to tell you to submit. Submit to this creator who is so great. Allahu Akbar. Allah says, that is the path of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. That was his example. That is his way. Allah says, He is the one who called you the submitters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all true submitters. In fact, in the surah, Allah speaks about the udhiyah. Allah speaks about the sacrificial animals. And He says, Allah says, the sacrifices that you engage in, you know, every year we have the udhiyah that we engage in, we slaughter the sacrificial animals at the point of Eid al-Adha, commemorating the sacrifice of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam of his son Ismail. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the meat doesn't get to us. The meat doesn't get to us. Nor does the blood get to us, Allah says. But he says, what gets to us is the taqwa, the God consciousness behind it. We should be doing it to try and achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam put a knife to what was coming between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That from the dunya, which was the most beloved to him. He decided to sacrifice that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We shouldn't be going about slaughtering our children, please. We shouldn't be going about slaughtering our children and saying, I had a dream. Our dreams are not commands, please. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that understanding. But... We need to put a knife to those things in the dunya that come between us and our creator, such as the haram relationships that we have. We need to put a knife, slaughter it, such as some haram activity we might be engaged in, 
such as haram income, such as lying, cheating, stealing, malice, hatred, envy, enmity. We need to cut those things. So when we are slaughtering the animal at that point, it is not the animal. It is we are slaughtering the bad habits we have for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leaving them on the ground. And we will carry on from that day pure and clean. Just like when we are pelting the shaitan, when we go to Mina, in essence, we are taking out the shaitan from within and leaving him in Mina. With every stone that goes out, you say Allahu Akbar and all your bad qualities need to come out. The first day, concentrate on seven major bad qualities you have. Maybe hatred, maybe ill feeling, maybe with each stone, one quality must be left in Mina. So that when you come back from Hajj, you have left behind at least 49 of your bad habits and qualities. You come back as clean as the day you were born. These are the spiritual dimensions of Hajj that sometimes we go for Hajj, we come back and we didn't even realize that's what we were supposed to be achieving. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, in the next surah speaks about success. And he describes success in one word. You want to know who are successful? Those who believe. And at the end of the same surah, he describes those who are unsuccessful. Who are those who are unsuccessful? The end of the same surah, Allah says, Those who are ungrateful will never be successful. Remember the word kafir is used in the Arabic language to mean that he who is ungrateful. He's, they are also termed kuffar in the Quran. A person who is not grateful. And kuffar in the Quran, in the Arabic language, also used for disbelievers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So Allah says, those who are kuffar shall not be successful. Now one might ask, I want to be successful, I want to be a believer. I spoke about this in this masjid prior to Ramadan. Let me quickly go through it. Allah says, successful are the believers. What is the highest level of success? You want to gauge your success? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next part of the verse, Those who concentrate in their salah. If you can concentrate in your salah, Inshallah, you've achieved success because you are a true believer. But obviously, all of us, our concentration levels are so low in salah, so low. As soon as we say, Allahu Akbar, we start thinking now, after the salah, what am I going to do? I need to get home before 11 o'clock. I need to have some ice cream. I need to sleep. I need to get up for suhoor. I need to... And by that time, the imam says, Allahu Akbar, and now we're going down. And in, 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 in ruku' we pay lip service to the tasbih that is there. We're busy thinking about how long this imam is taking. You know, I need to see the time. And sometimes we look at it in ruku'. May Allah safeguard us. This is the condition of ourselves sometimes. Really, it's a fact. Now tell me, we want to achieve. I want to get concentration. You want to get concentration. The hadith says, a person will only achieve the true benefit of salah for as much as they've concentrated in that salah. So if I want to achieve concentration, what do I do? Allah says, You need to stay away from vain talk, that which is unnecessary. Why? If you engage in that which is unnecessary, whole day you gossiping, I was going to say like a woman, but nowadays men are doing it more professionally than women. May Allah safeguard us. We, we go about gossiping and talking about this and that, all unnecessary things, then our mind becomes occupied with unnecessary things. We have no time for that which is necessary. You know, you have the email that is going about. People say you have stones, you have, you have rocks, stones and sand. And you've got one pot. What do you put in first? If you put in the sand first, you won't have place for the stones and the rocks. Rather put in the rocks first, then put in the stones, shake it a little bit. The stones will find their way through the gaps that are created by the rocks. Then put in all the sand, shake it a little bit more. The sand will find its way also in the pot and everything will fit inside. Our brain has a capacity. Say for example, the brain has a capacity, if we were to say in kilograms, 20 kilos. It's quite a big brain actually. But if we fill it with 20 kilos of that which is unnecessary, is there space for that which is necessary? Nothing at all. So let's first do those things which are vital and necessary. Then inshallah we go to that, not which is unnecessary, but that which is less than that inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us. Now, if you'd like to achieve the uh, if you'd like to achieve staying away from that which is unnecessary what should you do allah says hum you need to cleanse yourselves spiritually take out the bad qualities the word zakah means purification it also means growth when allah uses the word fi'l zakah and when he is speaking about the nafs and the soul, he is normally speaking about cleansing the zakat, meaning cleansing the soul. Like in Surah to Shams, Allah speaks about Qada aflaha man zakaha. Successful is the one who purifies his soul. 
So zakat here mostly referring to purification of the heart. Take away malice, take away hatred, take away jealousy, take away envy. Be content with what Allah has provided for you. If that is the case, you will not be engaging in that which is unnecessary. If you don't engage in that which is unnecessary, then inshallah automatically you will be able to concentrate in salah. Now, how will I achieve cleansing my heart? Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ Those who protect their private parts. Allahu Akbar. مَنْ يَضْمَنْ لِي مَا بَيْنَ لِحْيَيْهِ وَمَا بَيْنَ فَخِذَيْهِ أَضْمَنْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ We find a repetition of this hadith. Whoever guarantees me, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever guarantees the correct use of the tongue and the correct use of his or her private parts, I guarantee them jannah. I guarantee them Jannah. So if we use these two organs correctly, Allah will help us to abstain from that which is unnecessary. And Allah will help us, in fact, before that, cleanse our hearts. When we've cleansed our hearts, we stay away from that which is unnecessary. Then we can concentrate in Salah and we become the true believers who will be successful. You see how the verse works? The other way around. Now one might ask, how do I protect my private parts? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after that, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ Those who fulfill their pledges and their promises. When we marry, it's a big pledge. Allah calls it in the Quran, مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا It is a solid, solid pledge, covenant that you are pledging your spouse. So if you are faithful in marriage, automatically you have fulfilled a promise, you fulfill your promise and skittle effect. Inshallah, you will go right to the top as we explained. Now one might ask, so how do I become faithful? Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ Those who protect their five salah in the day. You start off reading five salah. Nothing brings you to the masjid besides the love of Allah. Nothing makes you read your salah besides the love of Allah. When you left out one, it hurts you. It pains. That means you are building your iman. If you can do that for the unseen, believe me, for those who are in front of you, you will be able to do just the same. Meaning you will be able to be as faithful to them as well. If you can do something for Allah's sake, without anyone putting a stick behind you and whipping you to get to the masjid, you read your five salah a day, automatically you will abstain from sin. Automatically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the ability to fulfill your pledges and promises because you, are, you have developed a consciousness of Him through those five salah. And then automatically, you will be able to protect your private parts. Automatically, you will be able to cleanse yourselves. Automatically, from there, you will be able to abstain from that which is unnecessary. And then you will be able to achieve concentration in salah. And you will be from amongst the believers who will be successful. Allahu Akbar. Look at how that works. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. You can pick up that surah al-mu'minun and you can read the verses and see how we've worked it the other way up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about some of the messengers of Allah. And Allah says, He mentions quite a few stories. And He says, all these messengers, and here the highlight is the fact that they all said, مَا هَذَا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ this messenger coming to us is a human being just like us. Who does he think he is? He's coming to tell us things. He's just like us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and after the, 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 the people told their messengers, يَأْكُلُ مِمَّا تَأْكُلُونَ مِنْهُ وَيَشْرَبُ مِمَّا تَشْرَبُونَ They are eating just the same food you are eating, and they are drinking from what you are drinking also. So what is so big about them? What gives them the virtue? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies it in a very beautiful way in the surah and thereafter Allah addresses the messengers because this accusation or this statement was uttered also against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we will see it inshallah either tomorrow or the next night and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuhar rusulu kulu min al-tayyibati wa'amalu saliha O messengers don't worry about their statements keep on eating the good food that we we have bestowed upon you keep on eating don't worry you are human beings, but Allah raised them higher than us because Allah gave them nubuwa and risala and prophethood. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to respect the prophets of Allah and to love them and to follow their message inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how when death comes to the criminals, what they will say. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ رَبِّ ارْجِعُونِ لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا Allah says, the answer is, Kalla. When death comes to one of the criminals, they will say, and we've repeated this in the past, they will say, 
Ya Allah, Ya Allah, let me have another chance. Let me go back to the dunya. I will do good in what I have left behind. Now I have seen that all this is a reality. Allah says, nay, that is impossible. And in one verse, Allah says, even if we sent the people back, they would still repeat the same deeds. So may we be the people who from here we do good deeds from now we take heed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of that surah, Do you think we have created you for nothing? Do you think we have created you with no purpose? Think about it, ponder, close your eyes and think about it. Do you think we have created you for no reason? Allah says, do you think you are not going to return to us? Everyone has already come to us. Those before you, all of them have come to us. Now it's you who's going to come to us. And after you also, those who come shall thereafter come to us. They will return to us. So let's think about it. Let's be good, inshallah. May Allah grant us success. Then we have a surah, surah to nur where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the nur of Allah. And the verses we shall read tomorrow night, inshallah, where Allah says, Allah is the nur. And Allah describes that nur in a very, very beautiful way. But in the verses we read tonight, part of Surah Tun Nur, do you know that in Surah Tun Nur, what is the message? Have we ever picked it up and read it? It's all to do with morality. It is all to do with remaining steadfast and abstaining from immorality, sexual misbehavior. People need to abstain from that. This is what is in Surah Al-Nur. Some of the scholars have said, those who can lower their gaze for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be granted a nur in the dunya and the akhirah. This is in Surah Al-Nur. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can turn to Him at all times. So Allah commences with the verses about zina and how the punishment should be carried out against those who commit zina. Now before we go into the punishment of zina, there are two punishments. One is the stoning to death of a, one, a person who, ha, who has been married in the past or is correctly married and they commit zina. The Sharia says such a person should be stoned to death. That is there. There is no doubt, no debate. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum have confirmed it. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu has spoken about it. Nowadays you have people who say, you know what, that's not in the Quran. That's not Islam. Why do you want to justify things when you know that the, the, the Sharia has no loopholes, ask those who can explain it to you. Look, these punishments of zina are deterrence more than punishments. It is virtually impossible to have four complete eyewitnesses who read Salah five times a day, who are brilliant Muslims, to come and bear witness and describe to the Qadi in an Islamic court, telling him exactly what they saw, describing the act of intercourse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Imagine you have guys with big, big beards, for example, and people who are five times Salah in the first saf. Now they see two people kissing. They'll probably look the other side, but I got nothing to do with this. Do you think, does it make sense that this person will then have a peep, watch, phone his buddies who he knows are on a similar spiritual level and say, you know what you guys, we need three of you to come here and witness this. We got to go to the Qadi there and to the court. No, it's a deterrent. Never in Islamic history has anyone been stoned to death except through confession. I hope we understand that. Never in Islamic history has anyone been stoned to death except through confession. Unless there was something wrong with this justice system. Because this is a deterrent. It is impossible to get four eyewitnesses who are brilliant Muslims who don't have a blemish against them. Do you know if you can prove that that man has missed a salah, his witness will not be accepted. Allahu Akbar. That's impossible. You can't get that. So let us understand it is a deterrent. It is telling us that we definitely need to abstain from this sin because it is a huge crime. At the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, there was a woman who was stoned. But that was from confession. She confessed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned away from her, told her to go away. Maybe you didn't do this and so on. And after a long time, she kept on saying, I need to be cleansed. Some sahaba even said, why are you coming out and saying this when Allah has protected you? The sin was committed in secret. Now, when people begin to open, openly commit sin in front of people, that is when this will come into place. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us all protection, ourselves and our children, from this, from this serious crime of zina. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commences with it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about something worse than zina. What is worse than zina? 
those who accuse others of zina that is worse than zina itself to accuse someone of committing an act or to accuse someone of adultery is worse than the act itself may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all and allah says such a person we, we must never ever accept their witness وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءَ فَجْلِدُوهُمْ ثَمَانِينَ جَلْدَةِ وَلَا تَقْبَلُوا لَهُمْ شَهَادَةً أَبَدًا Those who accuse others of zina, those who accuse the believing women of zina. You know nowadays when we watch a man and a woman talking and people come about and they say, you know, those two are having an affair. Do you know how serious that statement is? Wallahi, if it was in the form of ink and it was to be put in the oceans, it would change the color of the Atlantic Ocean. That is how devastating that statement is. Those two are having an affair. What affair are you talking about? Are you ready to stand in front of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal and utter the statement again? Allahu Akbar. Better mind our, our tongues, inshallah. We'd rather abstain, keep quiet. What is meant by that? Today when someone says those two are having an affair, they are accusing them of zina. May Allah protect us all. <laughs> So that is why we rather make dua for them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Tomorrow, inshallah, we will mention the story of Aisha radiallahu anha. And how she was accused and what happened as a result. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdi, subhanakallahumma bihamdi. Kanashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.